Welcome to Pets in Paradise TV, the show that explores the relationship between people and animals in one of the most beautiful places on earth, Hawaii. Here's what's coming up in the next half hour. We'll learn the meaning of natural horsemanship while watching two top equine trainers in a competition. Then we'll meet a Rottweiler named Max whose life depends on him learning right from wrong. Plus, find out if the Corgi is the right breed for your family in It's All About the Breed. Pets in Paradise TV starts now. Hawaii has a rich history when it comes to horsemanship. Starting with the Paniolos of the 1800s, horsemanship has grown and evolved. And even if it's a centuries old trade, there are still techniques to be learned. So today I'm over here at the Hawaii Colt Starting Challenge. And this is natural horsemanship training. Natural horsemanship is also called horse whispering. Trainers using this technique don't use physical force to break an untrained horse. Instead, they try to be as gentle as possible, using the horse's natural instincts to help in the training. And in some cases, the horses are raised to mimic life in the wild. So what the horsemen do is get uh, the horse to understand that the horseman is the leader. So the two horses today that these trainers are using have never been saddled, bridled, or had a blanket on their back. Other methods of training can be tough on a horse, tying its legs, blindfolding it to get control. Natural horsemanship is the complete opposite, but it reaches the same goal. Now, let's see how it's done by two trainers in a challenge. So these two trainers, Dan Olson and Russell Beatty, are up against a big challenge because normally you train a horse, it take at least two weeks to about a month, and these guys are out here doing it in a little less than two days with only two hours each day. People, they don't get respect out of their horses, and the horses just push on them. So I always want them to stay back off me. Russell is a pro when it comes to training horses. A Maui resident, he's been training since he was 10 and has taken part in more than 100 Colt Challenge events. So at the end of this of today, what we're supposed to be able to do is to take our horses, ride them. We're gonna be able to walk, trot, and run. Daniel is also an old pro. He grew up on a cattle ranch in Wyoming and now works as a farrier, someone who specializes in caring for horses' hooves. He also trains horses that are difficult to work with. They're actually training these horses in less than a couple of days. Um, these horses here have less than three hours of ride time and they're already on their back today. This is day two of the competition. We're about two hours in on this event and we're breaking everything down. We're setting up the obstacle course. So far it seems that Russell has been able to get quite a bit more forward movement out of his horse. He's been able to walk, trot, and canter pretty fine. Dan's groundwork has been excellent. He's done a great job. I am a little concerned because he hasn't quite yet gotten his horse to canter. So we'll go ahead and see how he does during the obstacle course. The real challenge in, um, outside of this round pen is when these two trainers actually will ride these two horses in an obstacle course away outside of the round pen, no walls, no structures or obstacles. So at this part of the competition is where it kind of gets to the nitty gritty and I feel like I'm pretty re well ready to do it. Now the competition starts, Dan is first. The competition consists of a series of exercises designed to challenge the horses. Horses scare easily, so if the horse doesn't trust a rider, doing the obstacles will be difficult, but Dan is doing a good job. Russell's up, but it's a bumpy start. He has some trouble getting up on his horse as the horse takes a nip at him. But after some gentle prodding, Russell gains some ground and is able to take to the course. Now for the winner. So the winner of the Hawaiian Colt Starting Challenge on Oahu is Daniel Olson. So Daniel, what'd you think? Oh, <laughs> it was fun, I really enjoyed it. This was 
Both men proved that even with so little time, natural horsemanship works. There's an old saying we've all heard, sweating like a pig. But some people say that pigs don't sweat at all. So why that saying? Well, they do sweat a little, but not nearly enough to cool off those large bodies. That's why they love to wallow in the mud. It cools them off like sweat would if they had enough. So where does the saying come in, sweat like a pig? Well, it's not about pigs at all. The saying originated with the manufacture of pig iron, which is a form of iron made when the ore is melted at extremely high temperatures. As it cools, the air around it reaches the dew point, forming droplets on the metal that look like sweat. So next time you're hot and the perspiration is plentiful, just say you're sweating like pig iron. Welcome back to Pets in Paradise TV. There are more than 500 dog breeds ranging from the world's smallest, the Chihuahua, to the mighty Great Dane. Our goal is to pick one and learn all about it in It's All About the Breed. Today, it's all about the Welsh Corgi. Originally from Wales, there are actually two dogs that go by the name Corgi, the Pembroke Welsh Corgi and the Cardigan Corgi. Both are separate and distinct breeds. Of the two, the most popular is the Pembroke Welsh Corgi. Considered the 11th most intelligent dog, the Welsh Corgi is an ancient breed, dating back as far as the 10th century when records indicate that they were used to herd sheep, geese, ducks, horses, and cattle. So obviously they're one of the oldest of the herding breeds. There's also a popular folk legend that says corgis were a gift from woodland fairies and that the markings on their back were the result of the tiny saddles used by the fairies to ride them. As old as the breed is, their ability as herders has carried through the years and even today they are considered one of the best herders. They excel as healers, which means that they nip at the heels of cattle to keep them moving. They're very agile dogs. You can see that when they're herding, but that trait also makes them excel in competition, in obedience, showmanship, fly ball, tracking, and herding events. Corgis were even used at one time to guard children, but it isn't clear if they actually herded them. As for popularity, corgis are well known to hobnob with royalty. Queen Elizabeth has owned more than 30, either Pembroke Welsh corgis or a corgi dachshund mix. She was given her first corgi by her father when she was seven. Its name was Dookie. Young Elizabeth chose Dookie out of the litter because he had a longer tail. She said that having a long tail would make it easier for her to know if he was pleased or not. Welsh corgis were first brought to the U.S. in 1933 by a breeder in Massachusetts. They were recognized by the AKC the following year. As for size, male corgis weigh an average of 30 pounds, females about 25. They come in red, sable, tan, fawn, and black, and may or may not have the white markings. As for health issues, they are generally a healthy breed and have an average lifespan of just over 12 years. They are prone to some cancer and kidney problems, as well as some types of eye conditions, including progressive retinal atrophy. Hip dysplasia among corgis is rare. Corgis love physical activity and need regular exercise. They're strong and athletic and are happiest when they've got a job to do. Some corgis are barkers. They're best suited to temperate climates if they're going to be outdoors, but they make great indoor pets. They need brushing only once a week or so. They make great companions. Just ask the queen. And now you know all about the corgi. There's a really spooky thing that cats do in the dark that you've probably seen. Their eyes appear to glow. It always looks like Halloween when they appear that way. But are their eyes really glowing? What makes their eyes look like that? The reason that they look like that is a special reflective layer in their eyes called the tapetum lucidum. This special layer permits their eyes to see better in low light situations because it sends more light to the retina. Because it's dark, and because cats have proportionally larger eyes than we do, the glowing effect, which scientists call eye shine, 
is much more pronounced. And if you're wondering, yes, dogs and some other animals have the same reflective layer and their eyes appear to glow in the dark as well. There's nothing as special and rewarding as the love of a good dog. For centuries, they've provided people with affection and companionship. On occasion, however, man's best friend can sometimes become his greatest enemy. This story is about Max, a good-hearted Rottweiler who made a bad choice, and now his life depends on learning right from wrong. So Max's mom and dad reached out to me because Max got himself into a lot of trouble. And we're gonna start his initial training this morning. We're gonna do a little bit of evaluations with him and see exactly where he stands, what his naughty behaviors are, and what he needs the most help with so that we can focus his training towards those versus spending time on things we don't really need to focus on. Rottweilers are inclined toward dominance and will test for position in the family pecking order. Without ongoing socialization and obedience training, they can prove to be too much dog for many households. Clearly, this is the case for Max's family, which is why his training will either make or break his future. All right, so we're gonna walk up to some of our trainers over here just hanging out, show that Max can actually go around a group of people. He's not gonna be bothered by it. Let's see, does he even care at all? Wanna say hi, bud? Good job, good job. All right, go ahead and stand up. All right, so now they went from a, a less threatening position to a more threatening position by standing up and being taller and bigger than him. He still doesn't really seem to care. He's just kind of hanging out. So. All right, guys, you guys want to like space out and we'll go through the rest of this? So far, Max has shown no hostility in this training session, but his previous actions have come with some heartache. He has recently shown signs of increased agitation and aggression. Uh, the day that Max got in trouble, they were all outside and the gate didn't quite shut well and Max came Max. out of the yard Come here, Max. and dad and grandpa and son were all running around trying to catch him. Um, in the meantime, the neighbor came out and was upset because he is a Rottweiler and they tend to be scary dogs because of their reputation. The neighbor came out and started yelling. Max turned around and ran and bit the neighbor. Whenever they went to court, they were given options. Pay the fine and put the dog down pay the fine and find the dog a new home, or they could pay the fine and they requested training, and the court system actually agreed to allow them to come in training. Max needs to comply with the terms set by the court and complete training. He needs to show he has worked through his aggression. But in order to do so, Erica needs to find Max's trigger and just what makes him bite. All right, so I'm gonna walk Max over by one of our first people and throw in one of the scenarios where we're gonna see how he responds to it. Go ahead, he's right by you. Get away from me, get your dog away from me. So she's acting a little bit more fearful trying to get away from him, giving some loud voices and throwing her hands up. He doesn't really seem to care. Brian's gonna be a little bit more threatening to see if Max is gonna show any of those aggressive signs. Max. All right, so basically the... Ah. All right, so what happened right there is whenever Brian put his hand down on Max's face around his mouth, he didn't really like that and he turned around and he tagged Brian in the hand to let him know, hey buddy, I don't really like that. So this is one of those aggressive behaviors that Max has that we want to be able to work out of him throughout his two weeks of training. I did something he didn't like uh, and received a notification of that via, uh, via Max here. Um, so there's different levels of aggression with dogs and whatnot, um, and that's something he didn't enjoy. Uh, I just kind of pushed his face. He let me do it twice with just a warning. Uh, I came back for one more, and he let me know that it was it was game time. So. Well, we just finished the evaluation, and I definitely can tell I've got my work cut out with him. Max clearly has some aggression issues, but hopefully now that Erica has an idea of what his triggers are, she might have a chance to save his life. When we return, we'll find out if an old dog can learn new tricks or if it's the end of the road for Mad Max. You've probably heard that dogs can't see in color, that they see everything in black and white. But is that really true? The answer is a qualified no. It turns out that dogs can see some color. Human eyes contain three different kinds of cones, those receptors that distinguish color. Dogs have only two of these cones, and scientists at the University of Washington discovered that they can't detect shades of red or green, but they can see shades of blue and yellow. 
Dogs use the variations in shades and brightness of blue and yellow to distinguish between items. So they may see the world differently than we do, but at least it's not all black and white. For the last week, Erica has been working hard with Max to identify what makes Max so bad. She needs to help him work through his aggression so he can continue living his life back home. So Max is a nervous dog. Uh, so anytime something changes in his environment or he gets nervous, he's instinctually going to jump into fight or flight. Off. Sit. So whenever his nerves pick up, he just wants to go and either defend himself or run away from it. In the event that he can't run away from it, he's going to attack it. Sit. One of the best kept secrets in dog training is the use of elevated areas. This helps to define space, keeping the dog in one place and making it easier to focus on their trainer. Erica goes through okay. a series of exercises in hopes to desensitize yeah. Max to the things that set him off. She hones in on his facial area because that was the place the trainer touched earlier and then got bit. In the event that he does have a negative behavior, he does something naughty like jumps or gets out of his position or barks or growls, then we use the e-collar. Um, it's a muscle stimulation tool that lets me communicate with him to let him know that, hey, that's unacceptable, that's not right, um, that's, you know, fix this problem. And then we go right back into having him hold his position and then he gets praised at the end of it because that was very hard for him. The e-collar is widely used by trainers, especially with dogs like Max with a history of aggression. Some critics argue that e-collars should not be used because they inflict some degree of pain. While this debate continues, it's important to remember that the electric stimulus is actually very mild, and in many instances, it can be the difference between failure and saving a dog's life. Okay, so I'll show you an example on how it works. Max down, one push of the button, it sends a low level stimulation to his neck where the collar Sit. is secured, um, letting him know Good that, boy. hey, we need to pay attention, you need to do what you need to do. And it's just a matter of communicating with him in another means that's been super awesome and beneficial for Max. Erica is bringing Max into new environments and situations to take him out of his comfort zone and to continue desensitizing him. But the most important test is about to come. We know Max doesn't like his face being touched, but the only way to see if Max has made real progress is to reenact the scenario. But is he ready? Mission accomplished. It seems Mad Max does have a soft side after all. While the techniques and training Max has received are leading to better outcomes, it remains to be seen if he will continue to do the same for his owners. Today's a really big day for Max. He's gonna go home for his first time after his 14 day training program with us. He did come for our board and train. Uh, he did the special on-leash version specifically catered to Max. Uh, we're headed out to Capulani Park right now to do a little bit of practice and meet up with his family and go over everything we're gonna need to go over so that they can continue to practice with him over the next week and a half. Uh, and then we're gonna get Max back for a little bit longer and do some more socialization training and his training is just gonna continue to be an ongoing process to get him on the right path. Go say hi to your mom. His mom's here now and he's gonna get ready to go oh home. Good, First mom. portion of our training is to train mom how to use the remote in the collar system. This is the collar, the remote um, system. Comes in the box, so you get to keep the box. Don't worry After going about. over the tools and training Max has received, his owner expresses some hesitation about using the e-collar on him. Since it has proven to be a very effective tool for Max, Erica offers her a demonstration to help put her at ease. And now you're going to tell me whenever you feel something. This will not hurt, okay? I feel a little, yeah. The little tingles? The little tingles. Max's owner realizes it's a small amount of discomfort for a big reward in making Max a law-abiding citizen. So Max's mom is going to have Max back home for about two weeks. Uh, she's now got the tools to continue training and practicing with him to get him on, continue on the right path. Max has the tools and the foundation established to be successful. So at this point, it's gonna be up to Max's mom and the time and dedication um, and how much practice her and Max get in over this next two weeks to see where he's at. 